as we're going to be reintroducing our athletes to sports, hopefully in the next few months, starting certainly at a smaller group basis and then working to a larger group, we really want to keep these athletes healthy on the field. So my first question would be for Dr. McCarthy, and does sex play a role in these types of knee injuries? So I know you treat a lot of both female and male athletes and younger patients. So what, what's your interpretation of that? Yeah, thanks for hosting, Karen. Um, so yeah, I think that's a really good question. And we see a lot of ACL tears in both male and female adolescent um, athletes but it is more common in females to have an ACL injury. And it likely has to do with many variables, including sort of um, shape of the legs, um, muscle activation with jumping and landing, um, a variety of other sort of factors that are uh, sort of gender specific. But yes, there is a higher rate in females. And Sam, I know you treat athletes from, you know, kind of the youth athlete level all the way up to the professional level, um, including male and female athletes. Are there certain patterns that you see in your female athletes that are different than your male athletes? Uh, patterns, what, what kind of patterns? In terms of when they experience their knee injuries or when, you know, do you see the male athletes with more contact injuries or female athletes? With yeah, no, I mean, so it's a, it's a really good you know, it's a, so that's a really good question. The, the majority of, when we talk about ACL injury, the, the majority of injuries that we see um, are really non-contact injuries. And, and oftentimes people think, oh, I tore, you know, somebody tore their ACL. It was a big contact injury where they're getting tackled or struck by another player. Um, but the reality is, is that the majority of these injuries are non-contact in nature and, and usually happen as somebody is you know, rapidly decelerating or, or pivoting and cutting um, with regard to, so, so it's something that we see in, in, across all sports, you know, certain, certain sports that have, may have higher media profiles, uh, we, we hear about more, um, but uh, ACL injuries are extremely prevalent across the board um, in male and female athletes. And, and like you guys were talking about, uh, particularly uh, higher in, in the female adolescent athlete with rates that are reported anywhere from three to six fold uh, higher in, in uh, young women than young men. So on this topic, we have a lot of athletic directors who are listening, um, team trainers that are working with some of our local high schools. If you're trying to focus on different sports, what sports would you say would be more at risk for these ACL injuries? Dr. Taylor, Sam, would you like to start? Um, I, I mean, I, I think again, uh, pretty you know, pretty much all sports across the board have some degree of vulnerability to this injury. That in any of the sports that require you know jumping, cutting, pivoting type activities, uh, since the majority of these injuries are non-contact, and I think that you know there are there are a number of things that coaches and strength trainers um, uh, can work on with their players uh, to help. Uh, work on what we call neuromuscular control or uh, improving the uh, strength and uh, dynamics, uh, landing dynamics, particularly meaning um, the control of the lower extremity um, during these motions in order to try and limit uh, ACL injury. Maura, in terms of if you were to talk to some of these athletes about cross training or other things they could do kind of outside of playing their sport, um, you know, especially during this time when we're in this pandemic where athletes are staying at home, are there any things you think that they could add to their routine other than sport specific exercises? Yeah, I think that's a really good point, especially now when people are sort of deconditioned a little bit, they're not used to their normal sort of training. Um, I think there's a lot of good programs out there on ACL prevention, and they focus on lower extremity strengthening and the way you move. So part of it is strength, and part of it is kind of the way you do certain movements. If you look at certain people when they do sort of um, single leg activities, there's a lot of potential instability or areas where they could um, put themselves at risk, especially for sort of a jumping landing kind of um, activity. And so I think anything to strengthen those muscles to help the endurance and also to improve quality of movement is good. Uh, Maura, would you, do, could you kind of, sh for the people that are watching, uh, demonstrate a little bit of kind of proper landing mechanics, uh, as well as those that, are, that may be a little bit more pathologic? 
That's a Can you just jump off your desk, Maura? Yeah, that's, that's, that's pretty much what I was getting. I just, jump come off. on, Maura, let's yeah. go. Show, show everybody the right way and the wrong way yeah. to do this. I can't, I can't do that right now. I have limited space here, Sam, but um, you could show them in your nice big office over there. I think the key thing is if, you're, if your knee goes into a valgus alignment or what we call like a knock knee alignment when you're doing single leg activities, then that's, a, that's a, an issue. Here he goes. Landing. Exactly. Thank you, Sam. Thank so um, I'm going to be getting a knee immobilizer ready for Sam any minute um, as he demonstrates the improper landing techniques. Um, it's so funny, when, if you try to demonstrate it in the office and you say, oh, you should do a perfect step down, uh, it's really, really, really hard to do. And parents who are in the room often try to do it as well. And they know they have significant sort of abnormalities when they're doing it. So it's a hard activity. People don't really focus on it unless they're told to focus on it, but it's really important. Yeah, it is. And, and uh, you know, kind of all joking aside uh, to, you know, to that point it's, is when, when um, Maura was talking about, it, you know, if you imagine your knee being here as you land, you want to be able to have control uh, keeping that knee centered. And what, what tends to happen when you have, um, kind of poor neuromuscular control or coordination with it as you land the knee kind of comes into this little bit of knock knee position which puts a ton of stress on the ACL so a lot of the activities and and um, stretches and strengthening programs that are out there focus on improving that landing control so that that you have better control as you land and you don't put your knee into some of those vulnerable type positions Maura, when you were doing some of your training um, over in Europe, did you notice that they had any interesting tactics as they were doing their warm-ups um, for soccer or anything that you took from, um, you know, across the pond, if you will? Yeah, I mean, they do things, um, I would say, somewhat differently over there. I think, um, you know, for starters, the orthopedic surgeon is not involved in the rehab process at all. So it's kind of like they, they're the mechanics, they do the surgery, and then they pass them off to sort of physiatry or rehab medicine. Um, so I can't really answer that specifically, because I didn't see a lot of it working with the orthopedic surgeons. But um, I think most of the things are pretty similar in terms of how they rehab and, and recover. Um, it takes a long time. And I think that's one thing that I think you'll probably stress later is that, you know, recoveries from these injuries um, take longer than everyone thinks. And it's really because you have to re-educate the muscles. You have to relearn how to move so that you don't get an injury in the future. Yeah, I think a couple of things, you know, the three of us played a lot of sports growing up. And I think one thing the coaches and athletic directors find daunting is trying to incorporate an ACL injury prevention program into some of these sports where, they think it's going to be a whole new way of life. It's going to impact their time that they're coaching. But instead of doing just when we were all warming up growing up, I'm a little bit older, but not by much, um, but just running a lap around the field, doing some static stretching, it just changes to where you're doing a lot more side to side movements, stretching different muscle groups. It's more of a dynamic moving um, program and starting to activate those muscles on a both kind of front and side, side to side plane, as well as starting and stopping quick, quickly. Um, Sam, do you notice any difference from your football days back in the day to now? When I, mean, warm up? I, I mean, I think that the biggest difference uh, in general from, from a few decades ago when I used to be uh, more of an athlete than I am now to, to today is, is the, uh, tremendous improvement in awareness and desire to to um to coach and improve in in ways that are productive and with a with a mindset of injury prevention and i think that that's something that is um that has changed dramatically is that mindset of you know you know are you hurt or are you injured Mm -hmm. you know, kind of thing to what can we do as coaches, you know, as coaches, I'm sure are tuned in here, what can we do as coaches? What can we do as parents to try to, to limit, um, you know, the, the risks of injury, which are just frankly inherent across the board. Maura, a question for you. Um, you know, I think sometimes it's hard, especially um, for newer athletic trainers or even parents, if they're watching their children play and maybe they don't have an athletic trainer on the field, how can you tell if a knee injury is just kind of a little contusion or bump versus the fact that it potentially could be a ligamentous injury or some sort of injury inside the knee joint? 
Yeah. So, you know, people get bumped and bruised all the time playing sports, as we all know. And I think you have to take into account sort of the, uh, the age of the patient. If you're at all concerned and it's a young patient or player, you're probably better off keeping them out for that game. Um, but, you know, there's some things you can do on the sidelines. Certainly, if they can't walk or if they can't run, they, they can't play. Um, if they can't move the knee and they can't sort of protect themselves doing certain things, and I think they, they definitely shouldn't play. But if you, if you have somebody who had a knee injury and, and they came off the field because of pain or whatever, you should certainly check the range of motion of the knee, see how much they can bend it, make sure they can get it straight, get it all the way bent. You should have them walk, make sure they don't have any pain or discomfort, they're not limping. And then you can have them run and, and then you can have them cut and change directions. And if they can do all those things and the, the knee joint isn't swollen, in um, and there's no restrictions then I think it's it's safe for them to go back and play but if if any of those things are positive or you're at all concerned then it's safer to not play I think that's a good point too in terms of you know knowing the athlete and how young they could be so if a parent is out there with the athlete feel free to remove them from play for a little bit and just see how it evolves with time I think a lot of pe people feel that pressure that it has to be diagnosed right then and there but just like you're saying let them almost make the call. So as they're getting back to doing a little bit of running or some side to side activity, they'll tell you if they trust the knee or not. Sam, I know you have a lot of resources as you're covering the giants, but still you have to make some of those decisions right on the field. Do you have any tips or tricks for kind of on the field diagnosis? You know, it, it, I mean, it is, it is really amazing that despite the resources of the NFL and, you know, the video reviews and all of the, you know, these, these incredible resources that we do have at our disposal to help look at injury mechanisms and things like that. At the end of the day, it comes down to exactly the same things that Moira was just talking about. And you were talking about, does the player have a uh, range of motion, strength and coordination to be able to, um, first and foremost, defend themselves. And I don't mean against another person, but defend yourself against injury, meaning do you have the strength and coordination to, and, um, and range of motion to be able to take your body through the, the various uh, motions and actions that you need to do? Um, and if you do, then you can play. And if you don't, you shouldn't play. And so, you know, despite all of the resources, when it really kind of comes down to it in, in the bitter end, it's pretty, it's, it's pretty straightforward, whether you're talking about a, a kid in uh, middle school uh, or a professional athlete, can, can you protect yourself and are you putting yourself at risk? And if the answer, uh, you know, is, is no, then you shouldn't be out there. Yeah, I think um, talking about that middle school athlete versus the professional athlete, you know, the professional athlete is able to have the performance coach, the athletic trainer, potentially a nutritionist study their sleep. Um, you know, they get that multifactorial approach to their athletic career. I think it's tough for a lot of our middle school athletes because they're going in changes with their body as they're getting taller, they're trying to build muscle. Um, do you see any specific injuries in that kind of prepubertal phase um, as they're getting into the high school athlete that's any different? Well, so um, I, I mean, I guess I would I'd take that question. I'm gonna I'm gonna change it just a little bit, and I'm just gonna, I'm just, just gonna like say politics, <laughs> right? Well, at least I, I acknowledge that I was changing the question. <laughs> but the, no, I like uh, the question, but yeah. that was outstanding. But what we're actually gonna talk about it. Um, <laughs> no, but but one Over one of the Laura, please. one one of the uh, one of the potentially bad things that comes from um, all of the knowledge that we have about professional athletes that that come back from injuries is that we see different timelines that that people come back, and so you know, for example, you know, when we see Adrian Peterson coming back from a, from an ACL MCL, he's injury, all right, and, okay. and he you know, and he's back you know six months after that injury. Yeah. There's, there tends to be an expectation among the general population that that is normal, and that's not normal. And in fact, so what is different about the professional athlete from the non-professional athlete is, is kind of your, your level of tolerance for, for what is acceptable and what is not. Meaning that, for example, a, a knee after an ACL at six months 
you may be able to develop the muscular control to do the, th to, to do the things that you can do. But the, the knee itself is still irritated, is still going to swell, and it's still angry. And at a professional athlete, or for a professional athlete, there are certain, you know, certain other considerations uh, with regard to timing that may push that athlete, uh, you know, maybe a little bit sooner than you would expect uh, in the general population. And so I think that um, some of the expectations that are, are assumed based upon what we see for the professional athlete aren't exactly ex extendable to, to the rest of the world. Yeah, and I think going into that, Maura, so there's always that challenge between, um, you know, if we're talking about rehabbing an injury or even rehabbing your ACL, where physical therapy finishes and then the athlete has to get back onto the field. What, were you, what would you say are some challenges um, that lack behind that actual, okay, let me just return to play because I'm cleared by physical therapy? Yeah, I, I think it's really hard because part of the thing that athletes need to get back before they go out there is they've got to have, you know, they've got to have full motion, they've got to have full strength, they've got to have good stability to their knee joint, but they also have to have confidence. And it's really hard to get confidence back if you haven't sort of practiced the thing that you're going to try to do. So, um, you know, with insurance companies and stuff, it's really hard to continue PT for a year. And sometimes you need something to bridge the gap. And, and one of the things that I've found is that there's performance trainers out there. We have some at HSS who are actually really good at helping to bridge the gap between physical therapy and uh, you know, playing a sport or even personal trainers and things like that. So I think if you have access to those, it's really, really, really helpful. And the other thing is kind of just getting out on the field or whatever, whatever sport it is you play and just doing things by yourself. If it's soccer, getting your footwork back, doing some agility drills. Um, and then, you know, I always tell people to be careful of their shoe wear, especially when they're starting out. I don't know if you guys do the same, but certainly, you know, starting with things like sneakers and moving to turf shoes before you go to cleats and things like that and uh, particular surfaces, but really just trying things out and then doing some things with another person and then, you know, doing some sort of drills and then ultimately kind of scrimmages and games sort of in that continuum rather than six months happens or nine months happen, you just jump out and play in a game. You know, it's, it's interesting you, you, that, you talk about the psychological aspect of return to play and it is it is something that we uh, I think generally do a poor job of addressing and we can certainly do a better job with addressing when you look at for example um, ACL and return to play the numbers of, of people who return to actual play at the same level um, is lower than we would like to think but the interesting thing is it's not necessarily because of a mechanical problem. It's not because of a re-tear of a graft. It's not because of this. A, a huge portion of, of people who do not get back to doing their activity report that it's because they're scared of re-injury. And, and so that the psychological component of return to play after a, after a devastating injury is, is not to be under um, under-recognized. Yeah, that's a, actually a really good plug for one of the things that we have, which is a, a sports psychologist who um, I send a fair number of people to to try to help with some of this stuff. Her name's Deb Roche, and she's, she's great. Um, I know, Karen, you probably send a few people to her, yeah. too. Yeah, Dr. Roche, she's um, actually doing some of these 30-minute Thursdays with us, too, so feel free to tune in to those as well. Um, so one question came up, um, we do see athletes try to use knee braces to prevent knee injuries. Um, Sam, if you want to start with that in terms of, hey, you know, I have four kids, I want them to play pivoting, cutting sports, maybe I'll just put braces on their bodies and hopefully yeah, they we, won't. I'll, I'll, I've got four kids at home and they all look like Forrest Gump right now. We got braces all over the place. No, the, <laughs> the, 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 the reality is that, that, um, uh, with regard to braces and injury prevention, the data to suggest that wearing braces to prevent injury is uh, limited at best and uh, particularly uh, limited to specific types of injury like injuries to the MCL, the medial collateral ligament on the inside of the knee. But I'm not aware of any studies that exist that show that wearing a brace is going to prevent an ACL PCL or lateral sided injury. So 
I think, I think braces do one thing though. Sometimes they help with that confidence piece in certain people. And so oftentimes people will start to, will want to start wearing a brace when they first return to play just because it provides them something extra. Um, and then they often choose to stop wearing it after time. So I think you're right. They don't prevent everything, but they can be helpful. One question that comes up a lot too is the combination of ACL injuries and meniscus tears. Um, I remember in fellowship when I was training, um, you know, we, we weren't very hesitant to take out part of the meniscus or, you know, if it looked like there was just a fragment that was flapping in the breeze, we were definitely focused on reconstructing that ACL. But now I feel like, especially between the three of us, we'll spend a lot of time seeing if we can keep that meniscus, t meniscus intact. So the question would be twofold. One, is there any way to tell if the athlete did sustain a meniscus tear? And two, what are your thoughts in terms of aggressively trying to keep the meniscus if it is torn? Sam, if you want to start. Sure. Um, so I, I think that, you know, things that are different today than, than they were when I was in high school is that we have uh, advanced imaging like MRI, uh, which is uh, which is much more developed now than it was uh, a couple years ago. A while ago. Um, and, and MRI is very good. It's not perfect. Um, and MRI sometimes uh, will show something to be normal. And when you actually look at it, it is definitely not normal. And sometimes it'll look on an MRI like something is torn and you get in there and it's not. So MRI is not perfect, but it has definitely improved our ability to um, identify problems before we're in there uh, so that um, there, there may be less surprises, uh, for the patient. I mean, it, at the end of the day, from a surgical standpoint for us, we're going to look at it and address what needs to be addressed at the time of surgery. But I think that imaging in particular is very helpful for setting expectations, uh, with patients. Um, that was the first part of your question. And then I'll just, uh, quickly hit the, the second part, which was, um, in general, the, the, we recognize uh, more and more as time goes by the importance that the meniscus plays in knee health, both in uh, stability and also um, uh, potential for developing arthritis in the future. And so I think that uh, as a field of orthopedic surgeons, we have um, worked harder and harder to find ways to salvage or save a meniscus whenever possible, but sometimes you can't. Yeah. So I think that's really important. You know, we are focused on it a bit more. Maura, is there any way to tell if the athlete sustained a meniscus tear if you're evaluating them? Um, you mean on like on the sideline, for example? Or if you're seeing them in their office, you know, you feel like they do have an unstable knee with the ACL involved. Any other signs to look for or, you know, physical yeah. exam findings if they may have a meniscus involved? I think one of the common things for meniscus tears is that there'll be pain right on the joint line, which is where you can kind of feel where the two bones come together on the knee. So that will often be positive, um, meaning painful. Mm -hmm. um, you know, sometimes with meniscus tears, you'll have sort of restricted range of motion, which is hard to assess at the same time if there's a ligament injury as well. Um, but yeah, so, and to answer a different question, which you didn't ask me yet, but I will, I will say anyway. Strong, um, Dr. McCarthy. I strong think very free flowing here. <laughs> Take it where it needs to go. Yeah. I, think, uh, I think an isolated ACL tear is one thing. And then I think an ACL tear with a meniscus tear is like a totally different animal and, and arguably sort of far worse. I used to think they were about the same, but you know, a meniscus, as Sam had mentioned, is really, really important for stability of the knee. And so if you've already lost one thing stabilizing the knee, which is the ACL, then the meniscus has to take up extra slack. And so I think, I think there, it, the meniscus is really important. We're finding out how important it is. Uh, but I think, you know, an isolated ACL tear is, is relatively easier to deal with than one with a meniscus, which requires a little bit more thought and, um, you know, effort. So um, thanks for veering that question in a great direction. Um, so, you know, we all take care of athletes ranging from, you know, ages 10 to 100. Um, are there different ways that you would treat an ACL tear in, 
you know, a skeletally immature or very young athlete, um, such as a 12 or 13 year old. I I personally refuse to do an ACL reconstruction in a hundred year old. Well, I mean, there's some pretty active a hundred year olds, you know, I'm just saying you're Olympics, Sam. (laughs) Um, So in the, in the ages where they haven't gone through puberty yet, super young, um, would you do any different techniques for your ACL reconstruction? Dr. Yeah, I'll, I'll field yeah. this one. Um, yeah, so uh, I think there's one thing that we didn't talk about yet, which is that um, different types of ACL tears can happen in kids. And so um, it's not really an ACL tear, but it's a, you know, an avulsion of the bone where the ACL attaches. So a piece of bone breaks off and those happen more frequently in kids who are still growing. Um, so that's one sort of different type of ACL injury that's treated sort of with a primary repair. Um, it's probably the only primary repair of the ligament in a kid that inside the knee that you, you know, you would do. Um, but then when you're talking about um, ligament tears where the actual soft tissue tears in a child who still has a lot of growth remaining, you have to look at the growth plates and sort of see how much growth there is left. And then you'll do things that sort of don't involve crossing the growth plate, meaning you spare the growth plate from any damage during the surgery. And those are called physeal sparing ACL reconstructions. And there's a variety of different techniques based on sort of your preference, your confidence level in each one. Some of them are similar to the techniques you would use in an adult, and some of them are very different. Um, And there's good data on sort of all of those. So I think definitely evaluating the growth plate in somebody who still has some years left to grow is really important. One One of the hot topics out there today is, is, ACL repair, or can we actually repair an ACL uh, rather than reconstruct an ACL? Um, so I'll take moderator privilege here and uh, and ask Dr. Sutton and Dr. McCarthy, what do you think about uh, primary repair of the ACL? Yeah, I think you know it's it's definitely a great question and comes up a lot. Just for our audience, a repair would be just suturing the two ends together, so somehow bringing the tissue that you already have and reattaching it wherever it's supposed to be. And then a reconstruction would be somehow using a graft or some other tissue from another part of the body to weave in and make a new ACL. So that's the terminology between repair and reconstruction. I think we're still finding out data about repair. So I think you know we're still waiting on that longer term follow-up since it's a newer um, procedure and we have some newer techniques out there. I think in youth athletes where, you know, a lot of our 30 minute Thursdays are directed to our younger athletes, I think a reconstruction tends to be the better, stronger gold standard right now um, for these athletes, especially if they want to get back to pivoting and cutting sports. Maura, any thoughts there? Yeah, I mean, I I agree with you completely. I think um, the one important thing is that every injury is different. And so you always have to sort of take a look at the MRI and things like that. And you have to evaluate what this person or athlete is going to go back and do. I think that the primary repairs are in two categories. One is the one in the pediatric population where a piece of bone pulls off with the injury. Those I think are indicated. Um, But then there are other primary or there are other tear types that um, some people try to repair. And I think you have to be really careful in in doing that, especially because as Karen mentioned, we don't have the data yet, but certainly there are some people that would qualify for it. So individual uh, treatment is really important. Um, uh, And, you know, you have to treat the athlete too, not just, not just the ACL tear. So if they have no interest whatsoever in ever playing a cutting or pivoting sport and all they want to do is walk on the treadmill for exercise or whatever, then, you know, they may not need to have their ACL reconstructed. So everybody's different and um, you know, you just got to treat them individually. Yeah, there's, there's limited data out there right now, but what the data that is, is coming out um, is showing that it is re- primary repair is probably inappropriate for the adolescent uh, and younger athlete. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You're talking about of the ligament, not of a, uh, yes, uh, yes, yes. Yeah. Not of a bony avulsion. Yeah. Yeah. So as we're getting to the close here, I'll ask kind of a directed, succinct question before you guys turn it against me. But what would you say is the average in terms of our, let's say, middle school and high school athlete return to play after a just strict ACL reconstruction? Nine months. I would say it's somewhere between nine and 12 months, but it's usually on the longer end. 
And it's not about that knee recovery or the graft healing or whatever. That usually happens around six months, but it's managing their risk after that and kind of making sure that when you send them back out there, they don't have another injury uh, so soon. And I think the data shows that if you send them back under a year, there's a higher risk of re-injury. Um, so for me, it's usually somewhere between nine and 12, but closer to 12. Yeah, I would say that. If you if you come to me, we'll get you back in three months. Like <laughs> <laughs> name that tune. Yeah. Yeah. Repeatedly back in three months. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it sounds like that nine to 12 months is kind yep. of a sweet spot there. Agreed. Um, I really appreciate both Dr. Taylor and Dr. McCarthy joining us today. You know, it's such a pleasure to be out in this community treating the athletes, you know, in the Connecticut and New York areas. And, you know, certainly if you have any further questions with any of your athletes, um, feel free to contact us over here. And then next week, I would love for everyone to turn in, tune in to our 30 minute Thursdays where we'll be discussing throwing athletes, preventing shoulder and elbow injuries. So again, thank you for joining us today and great insight by both Dr. Taylor and Dr. McCarthy. Thanks guys. Thanks guys. Have a good one. Take care.